paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Everybody, my name is Nick Bryant, and welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. Today, I have author and podcaster extraordinaire Sean Atwood on my show, who's recently written a book called Elite Predators Jimmy Seville and Lord Mountbatten to Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell. How are you doing today, Sean? Yeah, fantastic, Nick, and huge thank you to you for coming on our channel over the years. It really resonated with the viewers and unfortunately had to be taken down with all of the unmentionables that we're no longer allowed to talk about on certain platforms. Definitely. And uh, I want to get into that a little later. Tell us about your new book. Yeah, so I wrote a series of books deconstructing the prison industrial complex and the war on drugs because that was my personal experience going through the incarceration in Arizona for ecstasy trafficking. And when I got out, I wanted to, you know, continue that activism, which led me to Epstein and all this human, I'll say transportation stuff, providing, I'm trying to phrase it carefully here so you don't get in too much trouble, you know, pro procuring and providing underage people to the elites of the world and my channel became a go-to place then for Epstein news. I'd wake up every morning, read the latest Epstein news, 100,000 views overnight. We had 60 million views on that content. But it took me down some very dark paths, Nick, including interviewing yourself about the Franklin scandal, of which there are many parallels. And those dark paths included Jimmy Savile, his links to the royal family, Lord Mountbatten, who introduced Jimmy Savile to the royal family, Prince Charles's mentor, you know, what Prince Andrew got up to, uh, up to the very present day of Glenn Maxwell going to trial and now doing yoga and, and playing tennis in this cushy federal prison in Florida. Probably she's going to get Bill Cosby out at some point when the media interest in the story just dies down because of all of her connections. I mean, the Black Book, very early on in the Epstein days, I was calling all the numbers out the black book, Mick Jagger, et cetera, live, <laughs> live streaming it. And um, that you black that book. I put the black book on the internet. Did you, did oh, you know that, that? That's phenomenal. Was that the, the redacted or the unredacted version? Uh, redacted. Okay. Well, I managed to get an, an you, you unredacted get the version. Unredacted, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, that black book, the media said it was Epstein's, but it wasn't. It was Maxwell's. He was the one with the money. She was the one with the connections. And it's those connections that I believe has prevented her from suffering the same fate as Jean-Luc Brunel, who we saw suicided in the French prison at the end of last year, uh, and Epstein himself. You've uh, read the Franklin scandal, and the Franklin scandal is remarkably similar to what you have with Jimmy Savile and Lord Mountbatten and also uh, Maxwell and, uh, and, and Epstein. And... King, Lawrence E. King, who was one of the primary pedophilic pimps, he did some time. He, he busted out a credit union for $40 million, and he did some time for that. But he was picked up by the Secret Service and transported to a jail in Springfield, Missouri, like when this thing first started to break. And I'm surmising that they said to Larry, if you keep your mouth shut, and do some time, we'll take care of you. Whereas his partner, Craig Spence, I do believe committed suicide, but I also believe that he said that he was made a deal by this malignant corner of intelligence that traffics uh, minors. You can either kill yourself or we can kill you. So I think that he opted for a very 
his death was very strange. He was he rented a uh, room at the Ritz Carlton in Boston. He, he was wearing a tuxedo, and um, he had a clipping next to him about CIA agents being called to testify before government entities. And um, and then he said to the Ritz Carlton staff, "I sorry about the mess, <laughs> something to that effect." And uh, so he killed himself. But King kept his mouth shut, and he was let out after about ten years which will probably be Maxwell's fate. And then he was taken care of. He had a no-show job at a BMW dealership in, in Virginia. So I think that Maxwell, I, I think the same kind of deal was made with Maxwell. You saw what happened to Epstein. And uh, if you keep your mouth shut, you're going to have to do some time and we'll take care of you. One of the things I remember from the Franklin story, I think you said it was that the only people who ended up in prison were the bloody people who'd suffered the abuse. Yes. Uh, Alicia Owen wouldn't recant her abuse. She was indicted on eight counts of perjury by a federal grand jury and eight counts of perjury by a state grand jury. She was looking at 200 years and she still refused to recant her abuse. And um, she was ultimately sentenced to a kangaroo court sentenced her between nine and 15 years. So this odyssey that you went on, um, was it was it Epstein? Was that your portal into this dark, malignant corner of intelligence trafficking children? Or had you had you come across the Franklin scandal before? Or? So I started an online blog in 2004, prison blog, and the prison YouTube channel started in 2007. So we were primarily focused on exposing the prison industrial complex. I was posting letters from prisoners in Arizona, which I still do to this day online. And, you know, human trafficking was far removed from my radar. But then when the Epstein crossover happened into, you know, when he got arrested, he was in the in, put in prison himself. Simultaneously around the time I was researching the war on drug stuff. That's what brought me to the human trafficking component of, of this. And the first time I started to hear about the sexual deviance of elites was with Bill Clinton and what he did coked up as the governor of Arkansas. And it, it you know, for him to go and lock up hundreds of thousands of nonviolent drug offenders when his brother, half brother Roger got arrested undercover, by an undercover buying coke. And he said his brother's got a nose like a vacuum cleaner referring to Bill, the hypocrisy the corruption, the double standards of these people who will just do absolutely anything and say absolutely anything to get in power and behave in the complete opposite fashion, sexually, whether it comes to sex or drugs or whatever it is, it just blew my mind. So these psychopaths that get to the top of politics have no qualms about sacrificing human lives in the slightest. And Jimmy Savile, okay. So we spent years putting together a documentary about Savile. It's called Untouchable. It's done really well if you want to watch it for free on YouTube. I think it's cutting up to uh, seven, eight 800,000 views, something like that. And the amount of stuff we learned about how he operated is just absolutely mind blowing. So his offending spanned for decades. He had people in the highest levels of politics the royal family, the media, the law, show business, you name it. And he'd done that by design. He'd also raised millions for charity, which was kind of his shield. So whenever he committed an offense in the UK, because he was out of Leeds, he grew up in a northern town like myself, Leeds. He was a DJ, modest background. He was in the coal mines. There was a, um, an accident when he was a baby whereby they thought he was going to die. So his family considered him the miracle child. His eyes wouldn't close and he's just laying there and they thought he was going to die for, for a year or so. And then he survived. So he got this special treatment from his family and that carried on into his persona. But what he did was cold, calculated, cunning move. If he got in trouble anywhere in the UK, it had to be called in to the police in his jurisdiction of Leeds. Now he held a weekly luncheon for the police of Leeds. We don't know for sure whether some of these policemen were participating 
in these heinous activities with the miners, it is very possible. But the policeman who was in charge of the incoming calls from the other legal jurisdictions of the UK was on Jimmy Savile's, you know, mate. They were mates, basically. So anything that came in from across the country just got completely shut down because he had the Leeds police eating out the palm of his hand. Networks that are that big have to corrupt law enforcement to exist. And uh, with the Franklin scandal, you had both state and federal law enforcement corrupted. What about MI5? Was was there outrage? I mean, they must have known what Seville was up to um, at MI5, which is the equivalent, the UK equivalent of the FBI. So Mountbatten brought Savile into the royal fold and Mountbatten was Charles's mentor. And there's videos of Savile just joking about waltzing into the palace and bossing people around and cracking jokes at the highest uh, level royals. Now, any other mortal to just be able to waltz into Buckingham Palace and perform these shenanigans would have the utmost background checks by internal security and the police, etc. So th they must have had some idea of what he was up to, but they didn't give a shit. You know, the, the, I think that these psychopaths at the top of the royal families and the, the top of the political spectrum just look at human beings as cattle, as sheep, as fodder, cannon fodder, as votes, as idiots to be manipulated. And, you know, the this high caste can perform whatever abuses they want on, on the lower caste and it's irrelevant to them. They have no qualms. They have no empathy. So there was um, an investigation of Sir Peter Heyman, who was uh, number three guy at MI6, which is the UK's equivalent to the CIA, ran an organization called the Pedophile Information Exchange. And, and, and Ted Heath was part of that. And law enforcement knew about the pedof uh, Heyman's organization. And he was completely unscathed by it. I mean, they even raided, law enforcement raided the house that he operated out of and found a lot of child pornography and he didn't spend a day in jail. Um, it's it's mind boggling to me. Well, there's a lot of moral relativism going on here over the years. I mean, if you're going back to the Benny Hill era now, when, you know, Benny Hill was this comedy show where you've got like, perverted old men chasing young women around in stockings and suspenders through parks and stuff and spanking their bums to this fast paced music. And that was the delight of the country at, at the time. So the pedophile units, I think they were only set up in the nineties in this country. That's when these crimes were first being investigated. It is sad, but crimes against women and kids have not had any priority. If you look at how, the laws have evolved in the last century. And one of the things we're campaigning for on our YouTube channel is to end the war on drugs, to end mass incarceration, take all those resources and go after the bloody predators and pedophiles because they're telling us in this country, they don't have the resources to go after predators and pedophiles. Yet the prisons are full of the mentally ill, drug addicted people. You know, if you've got weed in your house, you're gonna get a SWAT team raid, but you call the cops and, and tell them the pedophiles tried to do something to you or something bad's happened to a woman or a child, it's weeks before the police do anything about it. So the whole system is upside down. And I believe part of that is because the people at the top of the system engage in this activity. You talked about pedophile information exchange, all of our videos on that were taken down. And there were members of the police and from the political establishment in the pedophile information exchange. And some of these people are still active now. So it, 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 you'd think that if you were trying to protect kids, the whole world would be behind you. My channel was just doing nicely. Once I started to expose these monsters, I have never come under so many attacks before in my life. Campaigns of all sorts were launched against me from black ops, hacks, character assassinations, YouTube uh, channel terminations. Uh, I was calling to the police station. I now have a caution uh, uh, pertaining to reporting on 
these cases. And if uh, I don't ask guests now to waive the anonymity, I can be put in prison if they've been survivors of this heinous crime. So, yeah, I mean, there are many forces out there, forces of darkness at work, as you will find, Nick, because you, I salute you for your bravery, for your balls in doing what you're doing. But we had a little discussion before we went and started this interview today. And I think you're on a similar trajectory as to myself, whereby these dark forces are going to rise against you, especially when you're doing more and more stuff online. And imagine because you, you, you were the tip of the spear on the Franklin case, exposing that, you know, your name always comes up when anyone mentions the Franklin case. I imagine you've already gone through some of that already, but because it was so long ago, perhaps now with the internet, everything is way magnified as you will, you are probably going to find out. It's interesting. Um, with within a year, I the Confessions of a DC Madam was published, a book I co-authored, The Politics of Sex, Lies, and Blackmail, which was about this dark, malignant corner of intelligence that compromises people. And then I also put Epstein's Black Book up on the internet. And uh, shortly thereafter, I was audited by the IRS. <laughs> so, um, but usually my situation has been man against the machine. Um, I've been trying to get the word out about Franklin starting in 2002, and I was trying to get the word out about Epstein in 2012. And I can remember editors would say to me, well, this still can't be going on. And while they were saying to me, this still can't be going on, Epstein was full tilt boogie. And it was very frustrating to me because the mainstream media was never receptive to anything that I had to publish in this area. How about you? Uh, how have your interactions with the mainstream media been? I rarely interact with the mainstream media, Nick. I classify it as the dinosaur media. I was regularly going on TV here in the UK and the follow through from going on the TV here into social, uh, you know, followers and things like that was just going down and down and down. I was seeing how the power of the mainstream media is just, it, it, it's become irrelevant. The only people who watch it these days, I mean, if I go to my parents' house who are in the seventies, I walk through the living room and I, I watch them watching TV and I see these plastic corpse like puppet faces of these politicians on the TV and they're just absolutely sickening. These people are so fake. There's nothing real about them. And I think that the internet has replaced the need for the mainstream media and these new generations, the TikTok generations and these new generations, you know, they're all on the phones all day long. They're not watching this crap being spewed out by the mainstream media. They're all on YouTube and watching podcasts and, you know, engaging with the new media, like, like what you're doing. Google owns uh, YouTube and YouTube ultimately took all of your reporting on Jeffrey Epstein down, all of it. And um, did they give you any explanation for that? Cyberbullying. What's that? Cyberbullying. Huh? So when you get strikes, it's a very vague explanation. I have st had strikes recently on Facebook. I didn't even know, they didn't even tell me what was struck or why, which was even m more pathetic. But with uh, YouTube, they at least tell you the name of the video and they give you a reason. And then you can meditate on that video and try and decipher who was being cyber bullied. So I, I think that they said I was cyber bullying um, Prince Andrew and Maxwell. Makes you feel sorry for Prince Andrew and Maxwell, doesn't it? <laughs> so was Prince Andrew, was he part of the Seville Mountbatten thing? Did he, did he get into this before he met Epstein? No, our research has led us to believe that Prince Andrew was, you know, central in the Epstein thing, but he also had a relationship with Peter Nygaard as well. And we've interviewed Peter Nygaard's son. We've interviewed Nygaard survivors. And some of the stuff that he got up to was, you know, 
these parties where they would take the passports and the girls, fly them in, promise them jobs of becoming models, which is the same formula Epstein had with Victoria's Secret. And then they would get to the island and they'd take the passports from them. And if they weren't accommodating sexually, they would date, rape, drug these underage girls and sodomize them. It's the same. I mean, the formula for Franklin, for what went down in the UK, for Nygaard, uh, for Epstein. I mean, it's it, it's like it's the same playbook. That they're all using the same playbook. And of course, uh, there's protection from the authorities. And of course, there's blackmail. Um, and people have no idea. And this is what troubles me. Americans have no idea of how many of their politicians are, are blackmailed, compromised. And I'm sure it's the same way in the UK that many of your politicians are compromised. We These politicians that we have are highly sexed, arrogant alpha males, which makes them actually quite easy to compromise. You were talking about Bill Clinton earlier. Bill Clinton is a, is a very smart guy. I mean, um, I mean, he's an ethical eunuch, but he's a very smart guy. But yet he allowed himself to be put in those positions um, that would potentially potentially threaten the power that he coveted. It's um, what's even more evil is that Hillary Clinton found, you know, would, would track these women down. Yes. Not because she was jealous of his affairs, but because nothing could stand in the way of the rise to power and pets died people were thrown off balconies people were murdered all surrounding these affairs and rape allegations with the women that uh, bill clinton was involved with when he was governor of arkansas with your book what's the what's the message that you really want to relate to the to the public with this new book so with the book elite predators really but but fortunately the epstein case you know that breaking out into the news so much has changed so many people's minds and woke so many people up as to the nature of the sex trafficking of minors and intelligence agency honey trap operations so i am trying to carry that torch still I wrote a book, Who Killed Epstein, Prince Andrew or Bill Clinton, which, you know, was, was a lot of based around a lot of my research from the interviews I did um, for the YouTube videos. And I just I'm trying to continue to carry that torch now with this new book, Elite Predators, but expanding it from the Epstein case to more a more broad look at Mountbatten and Jimmy Savile and there's just so much more to it. And I thank Netflix really, because Netflix putting out that program about Savile has generated worldwide interest in his story. We've had a lot of messages from America, you know, I hadn't heard about Savile to watch it on Netflix, but Netflix left out so much. So, you know, for example, there was a girl who was a top of the pops dancer. And this was back when Savile was preying on kids who were coming onto this TV show called Top of the Pops, where they would have the famous bands would play and the girls would dance. And it became one of the most watched shows in the UK. So this dancer, we interviewed one of her, her dancer friends from back then, because the dancer that I'm talking about is dead. She had a diary and it wasn't just Savile that she was sleeping with. There was a famous DJ and she put in a diary that she got pregnant and her mom found out and reported this and the diary of course went missing that you know the girl was uh they, they tried to paint her to be a bad person and sadly she committed suicide so it's the stories like that that, that netflix left out that we've tried to bring to life so we can remember the survivors and honor those survivors that didn't make it because there's, there's so many of those out there as well there's definitely a lot of uh, survivors that didn't make it. In the Franklin scandal, finding those, I had a list of before the uh, Nebraska Senate subcommittee investigator Gary Caradori, before his plane mysteriously uh, blew up in midair, um, 
he put together a list of 60 victims. And I, it was my job to find as many of those victims as I could and, and get them to talk to me. And finding a number of them was really hard. They did, they were, they didn't use their social security numbers. Um, they weren't gainfully employed. Um, a lot of them had slipped into the uh, drug underworld. And, and the thing about it is they ended up in prison or many of them ended up in prison and thereby compromised their own credibility because they can come forward and they say, well, I, I, I was molested by, by these people. And the mainstream media is going to say, well, you know, you're a, you've been in prison, you're a con, you're a convict. Yeah. How do you know we not, you're not lying? So it's really unfortunate that they, they're just not able to resuscitate their, you know, their, personas at all and it's a strategy of the elite pedophile predators to target co-home kids and Savile did it in the county of Surrey very early on there was girls from Surrey and those girls later formed a chat group online which a cop started to monitor which helped to break the story that they were talking about Savile's abuse of them. And I also interviewed Richard Kerr of the King Cora Boys Home. You talk about uh, all of these tangled web threads coming together, you know, the CIA, MI5, MI6, the Royal Family, Lord Mountbatten. Look at the King Cora Boys Home story and how the news is giving that more credibility in recent months as more disclosure has been made. Are you, are you been, have you been following events there, Nick? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Rich, Richard Kerr is a very powerful speaker. And I'm hoping that something can be done. I would still like to make something, get something done about Epstein because all those predators are still running around. And the thing that people don't realize is predators don't stop praying. All those, uh, those power brokers that Epstein pandered children to, I mean, they're still preying on, on children. I mean, th those type of people don't stop. But what's so frustrating, Nick, is that Prince Andrew's never going to day in prison. Uh, Clinton's never going to do a day in prison. I mean, these people are truly untouchable. It would take a very large movement of people, but it's very hard to break people out of their apathy, even though when you look at the statistics, a quarter of American girls as minors have, have been molested. And that translates into millions and millions of, of women today. And if you could bring them together, it would, it would be so powerful, but well, it's, it's very it's, difficult. It's, 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 it's men as well, Nick. I, I mean, yes. we've interviewed, we've interviewed almost 800 people now on the channel. And, you know, a lot of these guys that got heavily into crime have really opened up to us. And over and over again, they were abused as kids, pedophiles, creating all these crimes, creating all these criminals. And the government refuses to address the root cause of crime. So you get men, you know, molested and you got women molested as kids. They're not given the tools to deal with it psychologically. So they get onto drugs. The women get into sex work to finance the drugs or shoplifting or pickpocketing. The men get into drug dealing or robberies and the crimes escalate until they all end up in the prison system. And the pedophiles know that if they target the care home kids, they're on that trajectory. They're never going to be taken seriously in court. So there's, you know, who's going to believe the word of a Royal family member versus some shoplifter, drug addict, um prostitute it, it, it just doesn't stand up in court and that's what the pedophiles prey on and many of these kids come from very dysfunctional lower socioeconomic backgrounds so by the time that they start to be molested um their psyches aren't very developed at all and then at, at a very young age they're they're pandered and what i've seen is these kids are pandered and then at a certain point they outgrow their youthful marketability and these type of networks just expunge them 
And, um, and then, so you've got someone who's very damaged um, from a dysfunctional lower socioeconomic background who doesn't really know how to interact with society. And they just end up, end up going in and out of prison for the rest of their lives. If they survive, quite often the demons of being molested cause them to kill themselves either through suicide or through drug overdoses. That also happens. And I saw that in Franklin. We haven't seen that in Epstein, but the Epstein network is, is, is huge. And we don't, because our law enforcement has covered it up, we have no idea of the, 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 the true scope of the Epstein network. And we never will. I mean, the most recent survivor we interviewed was Juliet Bryant and God bless her. And she was with Epstein and Maxwell for a couple of years. And she heard them continuously communicating with the Clintons and for Bill Clinton to get up and say, you know, barely had anything to do with Epstein. What an absolute crock of shit. Well, Epstein came to the White House a number of times while Bill Clinton was president. I mean, so how can <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you really can't lie his way out of that one. And Lord Mountbatten, Americans probably aren't familiar with him. Could you describe him a little bit? All right, let me just, um, he's got a very long winded title. Let me just, pull, let me just pull it up. Lord Mountbatten. <laughs> so Mountbatten, Louis Francis Albert Victor Nicholas Mountbatten, first Earl Mountbatten of Burma. <laughs> So he was a British naval officer, colonial administrator, and close relative of the British royal family of German descent. I mean, we've done a lot on the ties of the Nazis to the royal family. We did stuff with Norman Baker. And um, so he was born in England to the Battenberg family and was a maternal uncle of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and the second cousin of King George VI. He joined the Royal Navy during the First World War and was appointed Supreme Allied Commander, South East Command in the Second World War. He later served as the last Viceroy of India and briefly as the first Governor General of the Dominion of India. He attended the Royal Naval College before entering the Royal Navy in 1916 and saw action during the closing phase of the First World War. And after the war, briefly attended Christ College, Cambridge during the interwar period, he continued to pursue his naval career, specializing in naval communications. Anyway, he ended up in August 1979. He was assassinated by a bomb planted on his fishing boat. Most likely in, IRA, right? Yeah, yeah. In County Sligo Island by members of the provisional IRA. He received a ceremonial funeral at Westminster Abbey and was buried in Romsey Abbey in Hampshire. But as he was getting more involved in the World War, the Americans' intelligence were keeping tabs on him. And they classified him as a deviant decades ago. I'll, I'll, um, I've got some quotes on this, actually. Let's see. Mountbatten. Mountbatten, because it was the FBI file on Mountbatten. Oh, there's an FBI file on him? Yeah, it's, it's ancient as well. FBI files um, classified him as a homosexual with a perversion for young boys. That's in quotes. So we interviewed the guy who got this dossier released, actually. He's been campaigning relentlessly to get more information about Mountbatten released. But there's a university in the UK that's keeping a lid on it. So... The FBI dossier released in 2019, thanks to an information, freedom information request, reveals shocking information. And Andrew Lowney is the author and literary agent who we interviewed who campaigned for, for the release of this. The 75-year-old intelligence file described Mountbatten, the first Earl of Burma, and his wife Edwina as persons of extremely low morals and contained information suggesting that Mountbatten was a paedophile with, with a perversion for young boys. American intelligence began the dossier in 1944 after Mountbatten was named Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia. 
They were obtained via the Freedom of Information request by Andrew Lowney, British historian, because he wrote a book, The Mountbatten's Their Lives and Loves. And the file reads, she states that in these circles, Lord Louis Mountbatten and his wife are considered persons of extremely low morals, homosexual version for young boys. In Lady DC's opinion, he is an unfit man to direct any sort of military operations because of this condition. And his wife is equally erratic. And there was an interview of Anthony Daly in Lowney's book, who was a rent boy, um, which is, is, is slang in the UK for uh, an underage, um, usually a, 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 a lad in his teens who is in, in the sex trade in London. And he, this, this uh, Anthony Daly claims that Mountbatten had a fetish for uniforms, handsome young men in military uniforms with high boots and beautiful boys in school uniforms. Oh my God. This just makes you feel sick, doesn't it? Um, and then it was the 22nd of May, 1979. Um, he was lobster potting angling expedition when a bomb on board was detonated a few hundred yards from the harbour. He died of his injuries along with his grandson, 14 year old. A local boy was 15 who was helping on the boat and Lady Bradbourne, 83, his eldest daughter's mother-in-law. Prince Charles described him as the grandfather I never had who visited the assassination in 2015. And now Prince Charles is King Charles. You know, there's even more vested interest in, um, in containing this information. So we have a uh, Lord Mountbatten who is a, sounds like an inveterate pedophile, and he is a very good friend to the king, the King Charles. Yeah, he was his mentor. It, it, it was, it was uh, you know, when Lady Di and Charles were having marital strife, it was Mountbatten that brought Jimmy Savile in as a marriage guidance counsellor. And if you read uh, Di's book, she said she found Savile absolutely creepy. But to bring him in, I mean, you know, Charles was having sex with Camilla on the night before he got married to Di, and Camilla was married to one of the horsemen that worked for Charles. So th there's no moral value system as normal human beings know it operating within this family. It was Mountbatten who encouraged Charles, you know, just, just go and have sex with anybody's wife you want of, of a certain standing. That That's quite a normal thing to do, which is how Camilla came into the picture. And then he, Charles is sleep with Camilla the night before he marries Di. It's, it's sad if you, when you look at how young Di was when she was brought into the fold. Charles was seen uh, dating Di's sister and then he spotted Di and she was just a kid really. With uh, within the UK, how is uh, Prince Andrew perceived at this point? It, he, his numbers, popularity numbers have to be relatively low. I mean, the absolute arrogance of this guy. So he goes on the BBC and claims he doesn't sweat. He doesn't go out in London in street clothes and all these things, which were immediately rebutted uh, by people posting instantly on Twitter. So to have this arrogance in this age of technology was his downfall and it continues to be his downfall. So he thought he could parlay his father's death, the funeral, into crawling back into public eye. And he asked to be elevated a military rank and to come in full military regalia. And the queen told him he absolutely could not do that. So we just saw him come back, you know, for his mum's funeral and people who were expressing the freedom of speech about how they felt about him were getting dragged off the streets and arrested. So he never misses a good opportunity to try and get back into the public eye. But what he's done is, is so heinous in the eyes of the public here that it's going to take a long time before he's got a, a chance a chance of you know accomplishing anything because the people just you know, of England are absolutely disgusted by him and every time he does try and come back they just stomp on him like a cockroach and 
go back into the dark. He goes, shuffles off, crawls off back into the darkness, basically. I think Prince Andrew is beyond public rehabilitation. Definitely. But his mom did pay the bill, I think, for the settlement with uh, Well, he Virginia. was her favorite. He was her favorite son. Yes. And we don't really know how much was paid, but it was millions. Uh, do, you, do you know how much was paid in that settlement? Wasn't it 10 plus million? I, I don't know exactly, yes. but they were the figures being bandied about by the media. But if the queen pays it, doesn't that mean the people pay it? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's the, unfortunately, it's the people who have a moral barometer who are being led around by people who have absolutely no moral barometer. And then we have to pay for their sins? And, and people, I think people are, I believe most people are good and want to give people the benefit of the doubt. They have no idea of how truly corrupt their system is. And that blackmail and pedophilic blackmail play an integral role. That's something that people just don't want to hear. What I see is America and, and Britain are both empires in decline. I mean, Britain has been an empire in decline longer than the United States has. But empires like the UK and America, they rot from within. And, um, and, and both the United States and the UK are, are rotting from within at this point. Do you think that we're at the point of no return or do you think that there's hope for rational democracy run by people who have a moral barometer? One of my favorite books is The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. And if you look at how it rotted from within, the proliferation of bureaucracy, the corruption, the nepotism, you see the parallels in America and the UK today. So, you know, going back over history for thousands of years, the center of power around the world changes. And in more recent centuries, there's been this hundred year world war cycle that has kind of reset things. But if that were to kick off again in this century, of nuclear weapons, what would be left, Nick? It's like, you know, Adam Smith said, the wealthy, uh, the hungry countries in the wealth of the nation said the hungry countries, they see the more opulent countries and they, the, the hungry countries, they, they, they're fit, they're lean, they're military, they discipline their military. And then they invade these lazy, opulent countries and absorb that wealth. And then they too become the lazy, opulent country and the other hungry countries rise up and on and on and on it goes. But now that we've got nuclear weapons, everything changes, doesn't it? Does that continue to act as a deterrent or is human nature such that our death wish side, our psychopathic side, that will manifest and most of the world will be wiped out? The United States is going to keep all its nuclear weapons as a trump card, as as its trump card. But yes, I mean, if that does happen, who will be left? Cockroaches and probably Keith Richard will probably survive uh, nuclear <laughs> Armageddon. Prince Andrew. <laughs> and maybe Twinkies, too. I've, I've been heard that Twinkies might survive. <laughs> but it is frightening when you have these type of people with this type of power able to push the button and when i was uh, growing up in like the 80s there were a substantial number of my friends who thought they're gonna push the button we're not gonna make it and um and, th and they kind of lived their life accordingly <laughs> so was profligate, they were kind of profligates. And um, what I see now is nuclear weapons, other countries have them, but the, the United States can make any country an ashtray at this point. And well, I think- well, we're, we're just a dot on the map here in the UK. I mean, look at the size of us, we, we'd be gone in the blink of an eye. So 
I mean, Russia has the technology to reach us. I don't know. I mean, China does, but I don't know if it has what the technology that Russia does. But the United States, and this is what's really crazy, is the United spends, States spends so much more money on the military than anybody. Um, we've, we've got this huge military, but yet we, we keep spending and spending. And the United States is also the number one um, pur purveyor of arms too, which causes untold carnage for people in the third world countries where we, where, where we sell these armaments. And before the UK had done that, but we've kind of taken over from the UK is the world's number one purveyor of arms. Well, the psychopathic Bush and Clinton crime families, I mean, them, one of their main things was bombing the poorest countries in the world. Hundreds of thousands dead, collateral damage, who gives a shit, women and kids. And it's amazing, the, the second Gulf War, which was predicated on lies uh, about weapons of mass destruction, that war was sold to 80% of the American public. 80% of the American public wanted that war. And I think about that, I knew that something was very fishy about that war. I mean, it, you, could, you could see people reacting to it on the internet with documentation showing that, um, that this war is predicated on lies. And Chris Hedges, a number of reporters at the New York Times knew that this war, that the second Gulf War is predicated on lies, but only one spoke out and that was Chris Hedges. And he's no longer working at the uh, at the New York Times, even though he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Um, <laughs> so if you speak out against the power, especially if you get to a level like Chris Hedges, and then you you're the censorship that's been that you, that you've been subjected to, because you have half a million YouTube followers, is very egregious too. Because you're basically trying to hold child molesters accountable. But Google says no more Sean Atwood holding child molesters accountable. <laughs> I gotta just say that YouTube has been a life changing um, thing for me. And I am very thankful that I have my podcasts and I have my platform. And I'm hugely thank you to the public as well, because when my account was terminated twice, the public lobbied and rose up in arms and contacted YouTube. It was trending on Twitter for days. And I believe that, you know, artificial intelligence was involved in it as well. And when it finally got to a rational human being, they made the correct decision in reinstating my channel, you know, on the agreement that I wouldn't um, continue to go down that road. <laughs> Of, um... that, you, that you wouldn't protect child molesters. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just glad I got my channel back, basically, and because it, it has been such a life changing thing for me. And I've met so many wonderful people such as yourself, Nick, through YouTube and, and all the interviews we've done. I've learned so much from everybody. Well, you've certainly been a bellwether on YouTube for people that want to uh, listen to the truth. And it's interesting me interviewing you instead of you interviewing me. It's uh, <laughs> the roles are reversed and your book, where can people get your book? All right. So who killed Epstein? Prince Andrew or Bill Clinton is available worldwide already. I'm the author of 15 books uh, written about five books about Pablo Escobar, all these books about the war on drugs, but anyone can find me on my socials on my YouTube on my books on any of the platforms. Just put my name in S H A U N A T T Wood, Sean Atwood, the new book. We're hoping to have it out for Christmas elite predators, but we're not sure if we're going to make that deadline yet. We're just rushing to try and get everything finalized. So hopefully it will be available for Christmas. And did you learn anything writing elite predators or was it stuff that you already knew before? Nick, going down that rabbit hole of honey trap operations, intelligence agencies using miners to in the, what they claim is the interest of national security. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. When I've interviewed people like Richard Kerr, Juliet Bryant, 
you know, these survivors of these monsters, it makes my blood run cold. There's people that I've had in the studio, survivors, and one lady, she was telling me what happened to her. And I felt my body freeze and I had to grab my, my winter coat and put it on. And it, 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 it's a psychological thing to not just to realize that these things are happening and continue to happen, but also that our own governments, I mean, you know, you, you hear about the predators in the schoolyard and things like that, but the, the, the fact that our own governments in the interest of national security are allowing kids to be raped, sodomized, filmed, uh, for people to be compromised. It, it, it's like in the war on drugs, you know, drug laws have made worthless pants more valuable than gold created a trillion dollar industry for the cartels and the mafia and narco terrorists and there's an economic incentive to commit the most heinous violence to dominate that market the intelligence agencies justify if they don't use the most heinous tactics to defend the national security of a country then they're going to fall behind in this arms race of intelligence agency operations so kids from care homes could just be sacrificed, could be raped, sodomized, filmed and sacrificed. And it's, it, it doesn't sit well with me, Nick. And I know it doesn't sit well with you either. I've been uh, down that rabbit hole for 20 years. And, um, and yes, it does affect me. Um, I mean, how could it not? Especially with all the uh, survivors that I've talked to over the years. And I would really like to see some of them get justice. Most survivors never get justice. And with the Jeffrey Epstein case, we know who the perps are. We know who a lot of the survivors are. Um, that should be like a preeminent concern of this government. And what went on in your country and is still going on, I'm sure it's probably more institutionalized in your country than it is in the United States, just because the UK is older, um, where there was a huge cover up um, of Seville. I mean, Seville could have been stopped so much earlier, just like Epstein could have, they, the FBI was aware of Epstein in 1996, and um, it could have been stopped so much earlier. And it is heartbreaking to me that and that is still going on. And what it shows me is that if these malignant corners of these intelligence agencies are going to use children to compromise people, there's no moral demarcation at all at this point. It's uh, pure sociopathy and um, or psychopathy. And it's really... I, I, would, I really would like to somehow, if, if humanity could do a U-turn on this, it would be important, but more people would have to be aware of it. Because once you have a disease, I mean, you can't do anything with it until it's diagnosed. And, and not enough people know about the diagnoses of, of this disease. You, you've worked very hard on getting it out there, and, and I've worked very hard at getting it out there. And as hard as we worked, the average person is completely obtuse to this reality. And the powers that be slap you back down and then you're left scratching your head wondering what have i achieved sean i want to thank you so much for coming on the nick bryant podcast it's been an honor and a huge thank you for having me on nick cheers and uh have yourself a great night you too my friend take care bye bye